Have a seat on your porcelain throne. It's time to talk some shit on the Powell Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week, my kid finally went back to school full-time for the first time in like 18 months. How crazy is that shit? What that means for him are masks and active shooter drills. You know, regular life these days. For me, it's more of the same. While I'll have a lot more time on my hands now that school's in session, I'm still working from home, just like before the pandemic. But right now, it's almost like I'm in panic mode. I came back from vacation with a shit ton of work to do to get back ahead of the game. So a few days ago, on Wednesday, I interviewed Tom Heiser, a legendary skate innovator, a pro skater, marketer, entrepreneur, shop guy. Tom has done everything, so it's fitting that he's the last inline interview for a while on the show. The stress for Tom's interview is timing. I'm the guy who's always early and always ahead of the game. But with Tom, if he were to flake or got sick or anything, I'd be screwed. And it's going to be like that for a few weeks for me. And then I'll have stacked enough interviews where I'll be able to relax again. But good thing for me and you is that Tom never flakes. And he's pretty wise and entertaining, which makes for a great show. Before we get into it, I need to thank OG New School skier Josh Lubeck for sending me some more of his NEMA vitamins. I'm not sure what's in them. Actually, I am. There's a list of everything in the fantastic packaging that it comes in. But I don't really worry about what's in them. I just take them. And I know that I have more energy than I've ever had in my life. And when I don't take them, I can feel a difference. So thank you very much, Josh. I also want to thank you for coming back each week and ask you to follow me on Instagram at The Powell Movement. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. And please support the brands that make this thing happen. They are Alpine Vans, Stanley, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Dragon Alliance, The Ten Barrel Brewery, and Rollerblade. Now, let's talk to Tom Heiser. Michael Powell. Tom, how's it going, man? Good. Just got done booking a flight to Italy. Fun, fun. When are you headed out? Oh, on the 10th of October. And did you just get back from New York? I saw you were there the other day. Yeah, I just got back from New York on Monday. And how's all the traveling with you with COVID right now? You hear about the Delta variant and you're from Alabama where COVID doesn't exist. What do you think about it when you're traveling? COVID don't exist in Bama, Mike. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I wish it wasn't like that where we live here, but it is. It, it's crazy, man. It depends where you go. Went to Italy uh, a couple months ago, and then, you know, we're like cocky Americans with our little COVID cards, and then it was all good going over there. But coming back, you had to get tested 48 hours before your flight, and that was a little nerve-wracking because one of the folks in the Nordica offices had come down with COVID, and that guy had hung out with us earlier in the week, so we were sweating, waiting for our results because we did not want to be quarantined for two weeks in our hotel room. Yeah, that would suck. That's a nightmare. All right. Well, we won't talk about the virus. We'll get into the podcast. And I'll start this one off with a topic that I find interesting. And inline skating has been your life. And you've seen many different waves of it. But before you were an inliner, you were a skateboarder. And was that something you were pretty passionate about? Yeah, I love skateboarding. I still follow it a lot. My brother's best friend, Scott Aronson, they had this big basement perfect flat floor in it and he had a like fiberglass double kick skateboard and anytime I went over there I would skate on it and Scott broke his wrist which freaked out my mom and then I wasn't able to get a skateboard until seventh grade when there was a class trip to Washington DC and I'd gotten the flu and my dad just felt terrible and he's like well we got refunded the money for your class trip you want to go get a board and I went down to BC surf and sport and I got myself a mini cab board with GMS trucks, rat bones, wheels, and I was pretty happy. Skateboarding's awesome. And that becomes your life for a little while. You also inline skate, or eventually you inline skate, and yeah. you also worked at a skate shop at one point that sold both inline and skateboards. Did you blade with skateboarders at that shop? Yeah, so that shop was awesome. It's called Go With The Flow, and the owner of that shop, Dave Schubert, taught me a lot about life and business. But yeah, basically what happened was I grew up in Atlanta and my dad got transferred to, uh, he got a new job in Wisconsin. So we went up there on my 15th birthday. I'm just like skating around this little town called Manitowoc, Wisconsin and went into a bike shop. I never forget it. Like 
was in there and there was these dudes doing steroids and stuff. It was like Pat Parnell and these dudes in some early rollerblade promo video. And I was just mesmerized by that. Like, wow, I think I could do a lot of cool stuff on that. A little time went by. I'm hanging out in front of my house in my neighborhood again, skateboarding. And these two kids go by on skates. And I guess they stopped just to be like, yo, who are you? It's small town. I'm the new kid. We talked and I was like, yeah, you know, you guys play hockey. And they're like, yeah, we play hockey. And then they're like, get rollerblades this summer and we'll teach you how to play street hockey. And so on my birthday on July 8th, I went and I got skates at that same bike shop where I saw that video. And it's funny because my dad was just like, yeah, you don't need these, the lightning ones. We'll get you the Zetra blades because they're cheaper. You'll never use these damn things, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and so that was that. And then we only lasted a year up there because it was just totally different than Atlanta. And my mom wanted to move back. So we moved back. And then I just plugged right back in with all my skateboard friends. And for like a year and a half, maybe two years, I'd go to the session with both my skates and my skateboard. Yeah. And thinking back to that time, your time at that shop, skateboarding and inline skating with skateboarders. Yeah. That shop sponsored Jamie Thomas and his crew. Were you inlining with him and his crew? Yeah, so I was the manager of the skate shop, and Jamie would come by, Devin Patterson, Sean Young, who skated for Antihero. Yeah, these guys were always hanging out and in the parking lot. And I skateboarded a little bit with those dudes, but I had my own crew of buddies of mine from my high school that I skateboarded the majority of the time with. But we would see Jamie and all those guys downtown a lot. I remember... Jamie coming in and he got a new board and like I was gripping his board. He's like, that's not how you grip a board. And he like showed me how to like grip a board even better. And he was, he was kind of an ass back in those days, like kind of cocky. And then I saw him like years later and he was super cool. And like, I don't know, man, the dude was just crazy focused and pretty much was just like anyone getting in my way. I'm, I'm getting this done. You know, the guys are just phenomenal talent and focus that dude and those guys. I don't know if they realize that they really had a big influence on me and like Andy Cruz because the summer before we went out to California to try and be pro skaters, those guys went out to California. And I remember they were in the parking lot to go with the flow. And one of them had a just crappy old car. And I'm pretty sure they had like 350 bucks between three or four dudes. And they were like, we're going to this contest in Texas. Then we're moving to California. And they just went for it. And they were gone, man. I think everyone but Jamie ended up coming back because it was just too real. They lived out of their car or something at Embarcadero for quite some time before they got put on. And they got kind of crapped on, I think, because they were just Southerners trying to fit into this like pretty hardcore scene that was in San Francisco at the time. But it certainly inspired us, man. It was awesome. Seeing him skate back then when you were younger, was his talent undeniable? Like when he went out West and he was just a Southerner guy, was there no way that they couldn't put him on because he was just so good? I think a lot of that, man, it was a time when skateboards had really little wheels. Yeah. And he started doing, I remember just being downtown at Bell Banks and stuff. And I was like, holy crap. You know, he was doing the arena rails and like backside 180 over the rail. And it was just like, whoa. I mean, this is the first real street skateboarding I saw live that just made me just like, this is super impressive. And I watched all the videos up until that point. And that whole crew is on one. I mean, Sean Young was every bit as talented as Jamie Thomas was at that time, but Jamie had the focus, man. I think Sean just liked to rage <laughs> and, and skate and just kind of be into the, the whole scene more. I don't really know the details of all that, but it was cool. So you guys are acquaintances, maybe not the best of friends, but friends. And when you see each other, you might session a spot. Yeah. But in 92, 93, was there any hate between skate and inline or did that develop later? Man, there wasn't at all. I remember I, I had this contest that I organized. I had Go With The Flow in the parking lot down the street, and it was a skateboard and inline contest. and It was big. There was a lot of people there. No one gave any beef, man. I mean, I mean, there was this ramp downtown Atlanta. It was really good, like mini ramp with a hip and bowl corner thing. That The Rancheros, which is like the old school dudes that were already probably late 30s, 40s pretty hashing dudes and they were cool they would let us skate there and it was all good and then all of a sudden it wasn't i think it just started happening you know like skateboard magazines started putting the propaganda out and hating on it and they did an awesome job at it <laughs> yeah i mean if you look at it skateboarding sucked the life out of inline by belittling it and over time it became a joke in u.s pop culture 
Is there a definitive moment when you can remember like a Thrasher article or someone saying something where it really kind of turned the tides and made inline not cool in the U.S.? The most definitive thing I remember that was like, wow, I got invited to the first X Games. And keep in mind at that time, I was probably one of the older dudes, you know, so there was younger guys than me, like Ryan Jackal and stuff. I remember being at the airport in Rhode Island and I hopped on this bus and I kept tabs on skateboarding. And there was a dude on my bus named Sasha Steinhorst. You know, he wasn't a really big name in skateboarding. He's maybe a team manager for some teams or whatever. But I remember meeting him on that bus and just talking to him and just like, wow, I was just blown. I was like, I'm going to this thing. And there's going to be guys like freaking Danny away there or whatever. And I'm just like, I don't really belong at this thing with these people. You know, right. like we hadn't really paid our dues or whatever. But again, I hadn't really felt the hate. So anyway, we're growing down. I'm like, yeah, this guy's pretty cool. He's, he seems to be cool with our sport or whatever. And I get off the bus and we go into the lobby and there's Colin McKay and Danny Way and Toss Pappas in the lobby. And I walk in with, I can't remember who I was with, but a couple of those inliners. And Toss Papa goes, Fucking fruit Buddhas. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the first time I like heard straight out that kind of hate vibe, dude. And it crushed me, man. I literally looked up to these guys like they were gods, even though they're just a couple of years older than me. To me, they were just gods. I mean, I remember watching Danny Way's part and Plan B questionable and Eight Street videos and just be standing there in front of him and his crew. I was just like, oh, God. And ironically, what was cool with that first X Games is Jamie Thomas wasn't included in the scene yet. And he stayed in a couple dorm rooms down from me with Ed Templeton. And Andy Cruz and I were there and we we're like, oh, let's go say what's up to Jamie. And we were like kicking it in his room and he gave Andy a pair of pants and stuff. And we were just throwing down and we were talking to him. And he was like, yeah, I'm not really super involved with the scene yet. He was still kind of a new dude to it. But yeah, it was a really wild time. Tony Hawk stayed in the freaking dorms. No one had money, you know, skateboarding was still kind of in a gutter spot and then inline was just blowing up. So it was a really cool time, but I was definitely realized like at that time we were the new jacks of the action sports scene and we were about to pay some dues. I didn't really realize it was going to be as hard a dues as we paid, but we kind of deserved it. We were a bunch of punks, man. Yeah. I mean, you have this thing and it's getting pretty big and then all of a sudden it goes from misunderstood to being looked as, as lame almost. And while the world was so close-minded and people ended up hating you for it, what was the worst altercation or what was the worst thing you saw between skateboarders and inliners? Because I'm sure there were fights and different things that happened over the years. What was the worst of it? Man, there's a lot of those things. I'm not a like fighty type dude personally. So at the Bellevue Skate Park one time for me, I was just skating the spine bowl thing and like, I'm in my prime. I'm skating good. Like I'm ripping this thing, you know, and like the skateboard kept putting his board out on the coping, like he was going to drop in. So then I aired over it and still kept putting it out there and having comments. And then I remember I grabbed his board and threw it across the skate park. And I was like, Oh my God, now I'm going to have to fight. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but the guy didn't even do anything to me. But the craziest thing I ever saw was Dustin Halloran at, I think it was called the X Games skate park at the time in Georgia. And Dustin Halloran's a street kid man from New York, you know, he's used to fist to cuffs like daily. And some skateboarders running his mouth at him, blah blah blah. Dustin went up to him, took his skates off, got up to square off with the guy. The guy swung at the skateboard at his head, it nearly hits him in the head with the truck. Dustin trips him and then gets the board, and like the tables turned. He had the board against this guy's head, and it was so rad because he was just like escorted the kid out of the skate park. And then threw his board into the skate park and shut the door behind him. I was just <laughs> like, yes, dude. But there's other situations. A friend of ours over in Spain a few years ago was just skating. And I guess he stopped to wax a little bit of the bowl corner or something. And he was hit in the head with a skateboard truck from this Hessian dude. I don't know what he really looked like, but hit him over the head and nearly killed him. Michael Prado is the guy that skater's name that got hurt. And it was all just because of skater hate. It was crazy. And Mike, Prado barely lived through that. And that was just like, wow, that's pretty insane. And I've had so many stories where skateboarders are like pacing around the bowl or whatever. They're screaming at me saying the craziest stuff. And it's pretty weird, man, to like be in that position where someone just legitimately is saying the worst things they can think of at you because of the sport you're doing. It was hard at times to deal with. There's times where I was just like, ah, it's not even worth it anymore. Like, go to the skate park and get haze. And then I just started skating with the earphones in a lot. And 
you know, when I was by myself. But I don't know. It's cool that society now just doesn't put up with that. You're just a loser for being a hater and a bigot. And I think that's been really, really good for our sport because you just look like a jackass if you're running your mouth like that now. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> all of that shit will get you canceled today. I mean, someone can pull out their cell phone and when someone starts calling you the F yeah. word or this or that, you can easily put it on camera and put it on the internet and that kind yeah. of can ruin someone's life. And back in those days, like you would be skating a handrail, cars would be driving by and calling you the most terrible things that you could possibly that say. It's got to be frustrating being made fun of for what you love to do. Yeah, it was it was terrible at times, man, honestly. You know, guys like Dave Carney at Big Brother were champions of the hate, you know, and they made the fruit bitter sticker. And I don't wish ill on anybody, but I do chuckle at the fact that that guy's probably hoping that stuff doesn't surface nowadays because it is whack. <laughs> I could probably say that most big name skateboarders who had interviews back in the late 90s, early 2000s, probably said something that they don't want ever to come out again against inline skating because at yeah, that time yeah. you were throwing around words that you don't throw around anymore because it's not cool at all. But they were throwing it around to people and they just thought it was funny and they wanted everybody to hate on inline. And given what they were doing was working. And the funny thing to me is that the first couple generations of inline skaters, you be included, I don't know if you were actually part of this, but a lot of the people made fun of the other types of inline skating so much to create an alternative universe where you weren't associated with the fitness bladers. It was like, we're aggressive skaters and we don't want to be looked at as these other stupid inline skaters. <laughs> Do you kind of look at that and like laugh at how you were exactly what you didn't want to be when people were making fun of you? Yeah, in many ways, guilty is charged. I mean, it goes along with when you're being hated by skateboarders and you actually like thought maybe these guys will accept us. If we don't associate ourselves with kind of these goofy people learning to inline skate right now, maybe they'll accept us, which is a complete delusion. But it, it certainly happened and pretty quickly when I started working at K2, I realized that this is all one thing and everyone kind of sees us as one thing as much as we wish it wasn't that way. Yeah, and there is strength in numbers. And I know all the fitness skaters and the speed skaters, they loved having the aggressive part, for lack of better term, being associated with the sport because it gave them an element of cool in their eyes. Given to a lot of other people's eyes, none of it was cool. Mm -hmm. But what's even more comical and sad, really, is that inline skaters did the exact same thing that happened to them to the scooter kids in the world. But scooter kids took over the skate parks and then some <laughs> inline companies started making scooter stuff. And what were your thoughts from yeah. that time when you saw the scooter boom? I just thought, Ed, this is just us all over again. And in some ways it was like, oh, it's a relief because they'll get headed on this more because that's even harder to make look cool. I mean, to skate good and make it look good, as you know, Mike, is really freaking hard. So it's really common to see a, a skater just looking crazy awkward. And then scooters were kind of seen as like, that's a little kid's thing to do. But the scooters grow up to be ripping bike riders. I can tell you that firsthand because my son is one of those kids. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so it's kind of a stepping stone to BMX in many ways. But, you know, I've seen that sport progress and there's been some dudes I've seen. I'm just like, wow, that was just incredible what they're doing on those things. And yeah, I learned from when I was younger to realize it's just not to hate that. And in reality, what happens is that we all benefit because there's more places to do all these sports now than ever. And that's because, you know, there's so many more people that utilize the skate park, whether you're scooter, skateboard, blades, bike, whatever. Yeah, power numbers, you said. It's time for my first sponsor break, and I'm going to start things off with the Ten Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. Ten Barrel does so much for action sports. It's crazy. 
They sponsor a team of skiers, skaters, and bikers. They sponsor the most important podcasts in the genre. They have their own events. They put out movies. They do everything. But the most important and the greatest thing that they do is their beer because they have incredible beer. And the newest flavor is by far my favorite. It's a German-inspired Pilsner that is perfect for just about anything. It's light, it's crisp, and I love it so much. So next time you're at the store, please pick up a six-pack of 10 Barrel and taste the difference. They also have pubs in Denver, San Diego, Idaho, Portland, and their hometown of Bend. To find out more about 10 Barrel and the pubs, head on over to 10barrel.com. My next sponsor is Dragon. And not only does the brand have a stacked team with athletes like Chris Ben Chetler, Danny Davis, and Brian Aguchi, but they make sunglasses that float. When I was in Rehoboth Beach, two of my family members lost sunglasses in the water. Not me, because the space-age technology of my sunglasses allowed them to float to the top when they fell off. This is a game-changer, and that, combined with Dragon's LumaLens optimized lens technology, creates superior color vividness, improves depth perception, and reduces eye fatigue for better performance. It's something that you'll feel when you wear these sunglasses. And Dragon is making it easy for you to own a pair. All you need to do is head on over to dragonalliance.com, go shopping, and when you check out, enter the code POWELL15. It's all one word and the number 15 with no spaces, and you will save 15% on your order, and you will look a hell of a lot better than you did in your old sunglasses. My final sponsor this break is Peter Glenn Ski and Sports. And while everyone can go check out all the deals over at peterglenn.com, Peter Glenn is so much more than just a website. For over 60 years, Peter Glenn has been getting people out there. Whether you're at one of their East Coast stores or online, you aren't just another transaction to Peter Glenn. You're part of the family. I've worked with a lot of retailers over the years, and that's what separates Peter Glenn from the rest. They care about earning your business. They have a true no-hassle return policy, and they have all the products, all the brands, and the best deals. So please check out Peter Glenn when you're buying all of your outdoor gear. That's round one of sponsors for me. Now let's jump back into the podcast. Do you look at, I won't say the demise because there hasn't been a demise, but there was a definitely ramp down in numbers for a long Uh, period of time from 98 till the pandemic almost. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Do you look at that decline as something that has a direct correlation to how the other sports looked and treated inline in the U.S.? I definitely think so. I mean, again, you know, you go back to X Games when we were on TV and we were a bunch of young punks and Arlo Eisenberg was our face to the whole thing. and. He's a pretty strong personality guy, and like he went into some of those meetings and spoke his mind, which a lot of things he said was valid, but kind of the way it was handled maybe wasn't the most professional way. But the reality is you had like Matt Hoffman and Tony Hawk, and these guys, they saw their sports die to nothing, and they were like, wow, this is our time again. They knew right away, and they were really smart about it. While we were just like, bah, 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 complaining and just acting immature, those guys were dialing it in and making sure that their boys and their people were getting the spots at ESPN to design the courses to be on the mic and all that stuff while we were just like big bubble heads. And that was the real big start of a decline, I think, is when we didn't have television coverage anymore. Unlike now where we have Instagram and YouTube and stuff where kids can go on, if they're into something, they're going to watch it. And I think that's the reason why this like real small subculture of aggressive skating has not died completely. Because that came on right as we were really starting to die. Are you seeing kids get back into it? Because when the X Games stopped and there was no feeder system to get into a big contests, it seemed like we lost a generation of kids that could be part of inline skating. We did. And when you speak about skating, so in my mind, there's like the aggressive skating stuff, my background, and there's regular skating. And the regular recreational skating stuff, all ages have gotten back into that since COVID. And then the aggressive skating stuff, a lot of the guys that stopped skating in the last 10 years that maybe had kids or whatever, they're in the mid thirties, the forties, they picked it back up. And I haven't seen a lot of young kids yet get back into the skate parks and street skating. I was just at the event in New York and there was just like three kids under the age of probably 12 that were there, you know? And so it's still something that our industry needs to work on. The events aren't really conducive to kind of a family vibe in a lot of cases, because for so many years it was just, these older dudes raging and like, you know, having a good time. It didn't really matter because there wasn't many people there. No one cared. And now it's time for our industry to kind of wise up a little bit and realize that the the moment's now to do a good job at this stuff. And there's guys that are doing that. So I have faith that it's going to continue in the right direction. 
Okay. Well, before anyone can hate on you and before you can build the sport, you have to have a childhood. And you grew up outside of Atlanta, Roswell, the home of Chick-fil-A, who hates people as well, but they have a great chicken sandwich. And it's good, Mike. It's good. I love the sandwich. Yeah, I think it's better than Popeye's. But they do hate my cousin and some other people, and that kind of sucks. That does suck. Yeah. yeah. But you also grew up in an area with a huge roller skating culture. And were you a rink rat on quads when you were growing up as a little kid? Man, I was the quaddest guy. Yeah, we would go Wednesdays and Friday nights just about every week. And my brothers were the cooler guys above me. And especially my brother, Steve, he was fast and stylish. And this was in the time of breakdancing and stuff in the mid 80s. He was pretty fresh at that. The chicks dug him. So being in relation to my brothers helped me a lot. And we had a great time at the roller rink. And a bunch of my friends would all go. And it was it was a rad time. I really enjoyed that. Was that your babysitter growing up? They just drop you and the brothers off and you eat yeah, sometimes, pizza for sure. and whatever and play video games and skate? Yeah, pretty much, man. The breakdancing room was pretty cool, too. They had a little like breakdance room. Where you could get busy. And I had a couple pop and locks in there, Mike. So, you know. Nice, nice. I don't know if I've ever mentioned this to you, but when I was younger, my parents hired a professional breakdancer to come over and teach us breakdancing at our house. And I can still windmill. You can still windmill. Yeah. I broke my toe doing it a few years back, but I can still do it. Mike 2.0 probably is really good at it. Freaking super fit, Mike, yeah, that I yeah. saw in Seattle a couple months ago. <laughs> I have not tried breakdancing since I lost a bunch of weight. I'd probably be a lot better than that. Yeah. Another thing that Heisers did, all the Heisers did, was wrestle. Oh, yeah. And do you do that from a young age? I started wrestling, I think, when I was like eight years old. Okay. That went on year round till... Year round. Yeah, oh yeah. Freestyle wrestling goes year round. There's folk style that they do in high schools. And then there's freestyle and Greco Roman, which is what they do on an international level. And as a kid, those are what tournaments were. They're primarily freestyle wrestling events. And it's just like a faster paced thing where there's kind of less rules in a way. There's more throws and it was cool. And I was really into that and good at it. And then at about the age of 15, I just was like, not into this anymore. I want to skate. And my, my old man was a crazy good wrestler, state champ in Wisconsin, went to University of Wisconsin. We had a wrestling mat in our basement. <laughs> and it got to the point where he was getting more upset when I'd lose a match than I was. And I was just kind of like, ah, you know, and I think a lot of my drive to wrestle was because I wanted to make my dad proud, you know, and that's a natural thing, I think, for young men to do. And yeah, I loved it. I'm super glad I got to do it because it's come in handy when people get rowdy at a bar or whatever and um, taught me a lot of discipline and hard work. It's probably the hardest sport I've ever done in my life. And it was a cool time with my dad too. You know, He's a super busy like salesman for Herman Miller and he was gone most of the time. But when there was a wrestling thing, he was there, man. You know, So yeah. that was cool. So like you mentioned earlier, you guys moved to Wisconsin, which has to totally suck when you're like 12, 13, 14 years old. Totally weird. But you only go there for eight, nine months because Wisconsin sucks in the winter and you guys hate that. <laughs> yeah. Mainly my mom didn't make friends there, right? You know, so it was, it was tough for her. Small towns are kind of like that. People have their people that they've grown up with. And kind of hard to break through. Moving there is definitely something that changed your whole life because going there is where you first see inline skates and you get your first yeah. pair while you're in Wisconsin. And given while you don't stay there, you do a little bit of hockey there. You come back to the Atlanta area, and is it pretty much moving right back into your old life, like back to the same school and same friends? It really was. At that age, man, things are changing so fast that the friend group did change a little bit during that time. But for the most part, it was all the same buddies and people and like my skateboard buddies. It was a pretty cool time because that was still when it was kind of punk to be a skater in high school and stuff. Not, it's not like now where every kid wears vans. Yeah, I mean, like the Thrasher t-shirt is just overdone everywhere you look now. Yeah, it was actually something back then, which is cool. You hear Tony Hawk talk about it constantly. Yeah, we came from punks and now we're in the Olympics and stuff, but it really was like that. Yeah, you were looked at as a scumbag who was going to smoke cigarettes with your friends. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was rad. I mean, we get out of school, we'd go to the, there was a shopping center near our house that we could skate to as a pretty good skate. And then you'd pop out of the woods and you're in this like shopping mall zone and we had little DIY ramps and curbs and ledges and stuff to skate and it was it was awesome it was some of the best times of my life were behind home depot when i was a kid you know <laughs> not too far after that you get sponsored you're working at the skate shop and i don't know if you send in tapes or whatever but i think you have rollerblade and hyper supporting you a little bit 
And what does that mean? Did they send you free product? You did your research, Mike Powell. It's impressive. That's what I try to do. Yeah, that's pretty good. So when I worked at Go With The Flow, when I moved back from Wisconsin, I worked at Go With The Flow. They sold a lot of rollerblade product, like rollerblade brand product at the time. It was crazy. And I sold a ton of that stuff. I sold kayaks and skateboards, everything. But the uh, local rep for Rollerblade came in and my boss, Dave, put me on with them. And he also was the rep for Hyperwheels. And so I think I got two packages a year from Rollerblade. It was like a pair of skates, knee pads, elbow pads, a helmet. And then Hyperwheels was rad because they would send huge boxes of wheels. So that was cool because we'd go through them quite a bit. Launch ramps, to flat all day, braking wheels, and <laughs> hooking up all my friends. And we had a great time. In school, are kids aware that you're a sponsored skater? And is that cool? Or are you looked at as the weird art skater guy? It's all that. Um, <laughs> I was super into art. I got some learning disability crap my whole life. So regular school wasn't good, but I was good at drawing and painting. So uh, I, I hung out a lot with kind of the art weirdos. But then I also had friends that were on the football team. I think we had a pretty unique high school scene where I think those guys did think it was cool what I did. And there was a couple spots at my high school and then people saw me doing what I did and they were just like, damn, that's really freaking cool. And then we started traveling senior year a little bit and they're like, damn, you went to California or whatever, you know? So yeah, it ended up being something that helped with the cool factor at school in, in many ways. And I, it really was that the guys and gals that I hung out with are, most of them are really cool people. You graduate in like 1994 and mm -hmm. you, you do the same thing that Jamie Thomas did, but the inline yeah. version, you move to California and you yeah. end up qualifying for the NIST Pro Tour in like seventh place. Yeah. Is that whole qualifying trip for you just like a total dream? Like you're up against all these people you've heard of and you actually can stand up against them and do well? Is that kind of mind blowing? Yeah. I mean, it was mind blowing and there was no one to look up to at the time. There was nothing really. So like the only person I'd heard of was Arlo. From inline ma inline magazine, there was like a couple pictures of him like jumping barrels or something. Okay. You know, that's the only thing I'd seen of the guy. And so when we got there to Cali, a lot of us got invited to stay at Mark Shays' place, who started the ASA, which is the first tour. Mark was friends with Nick Hartman, who owned FR Wheels, who I skated for at the time, and we all stayed there. And I met like Ron Hunter and Ryan Jacqueline and Tim Ward and Cesar Moore. And I think there was probably 12 of us sleeping on the floor of this apartment in Venice. It was amazing. And so I was there for six weeks or whatever, and there was three contests. And yeah, I qualified, and I was really stoked. And it was on ramps and launch boxy sort of things that we didn't have in Atlanta. We had street. There was no skate parks in Atlanta. Zero, none. There was a mini ramp in Peachtree City, which was like an hour away from where we lived. Yeah, so I was stoked to get seventh at that event because didn't skate transitions very much. and. From there, we all, like basically any of the dudes in the top 10 got put on. And I had to bail early that summer because school at Atlanta College of Arts started before the like finals of the whole series was done. And I had a little scholarship at Atlanta College of Art. And so I went back and did that because I loved art too. And I did that for the full freshman year. And I remember like right towards the end of that, K2 hit up Mark Shays and said, hey, Who's somebody that's got a vision for the sport with cool product ideas and like where this thing needs to go? And Mark thought of me because he remembered me staying at his little apartment in Venice. And I was always like modifying my skates and everybody else's stuff and like always trying to make them work for what we were doing because the skates were not designed for grinding and jumping off stuff really. And from there, it just took off, man. K2 put me on and the rest was history. I'm going to backtrack a little bit. So you're in California and then you head back mm -hmm. to Atlanta. When does Hoax 2 happen in your life? Because it's like a seminal movie in skate and it shows the lifestyle and what skating can be. And these guys are having fun on the road and you're in the Hoax 2. I mean, yeah, that lives forever. How does that all come together for you? I think that was 1995. It's a little fuzzy, all that. All this, that time was just so much going on. But yeah, I think I was in art school and then I was working at a different shop downtown Atlanta called Asphalt Flight School. And we heard through there that Craig Carroll or one of the dudes that did the hoax videos contacted the shop, said, we're coming through. Like, are there any people skating? And then there was us, you know, it was like me and Andy Cruz and Frankie Lascavio and Nate Garrison. We were like the dudes doing it. And so they came to town and we just like went insane. What's crazy is they filmed so much stuff that wasn't in that video. I wish I could find those tapes because there was like, top soles and stuff that we were doing on things and the things that hadn't been put on video yet that we had 
invented or whatever. Like there was so much stuff going on. There's probably guys in Australia doing the same tricks, but like we thought we invented them, you know? Yeah. And so I would love to find those lost tapes, but that video was really groundbreaking for the sport because it really showed what you could do on skates and that the potential was limitless and that people loved it. You had it paired to good music at the time. You know, we all like 311 and all that stuff was in there. It was a lifestyle piece too, I feel like. It was, man. And they're really like, I was just talking to the guys that skate for me now the other day. It's like, no one's capturing like who any of the skaters are. It's just all skate videos. And I think we're, as a sport, missing the mark because we're not creating personalities. We just make complicated skate videos that are awesome that we all love because we're core into it. But new skaters see it and they just get lost at sea. They don't know the difference between this, that, and the other grind. But yeah, Hoax 2 was so good, man. It really made things pop off for us. I think I was already skating for K2 at the time. I was on the K2 Soul Slide yep. skate, which was a bit of a nightmare, but that was the precursor to K2 just really killing it and doing something cool back then. And I guess if we're going to talk about the K2 Soul Slide, we need to talk about your X Games experience, which is 95 as well. It's the first one. Oh, you God, you yeah. talked about going there and yeah. you've, you've mentioned a whole bunch about it, but really what that does is make you realize how important everything else in life is, I think, other than skating, because at warmups, you blow your knee out and mm -hmm. it's all because you're on the soul slide because K2 is like, hey, <laughs> you're a pro skater for us and we want you to be on this skate, even though you were on yeah. another skate that you've tinkered with and it doesn't function like it should and you end up getting hurt. You're not an employee for K2 yet. So is it like parents mm -hmm. insurance that helps you take care of all that? Oh, dude. So going into that's ironic. I remember leaving my, my house and my dad didn't really understand skating why would he you know this is a weird thing he's like whatever you do don't break your hip or your knee or some shit you know <laughs> right and so i go off to the event and then i have that experience in the lobby with my heroes who basically just completely diss us so my mind really wasn't right you know like front siding down 15 stair rails was like we did that every day right and it was like no big deal but i went out there i had brand new skates and you need for those of you that don't grind and skate, you need like a groove in between your second and third wheel to lock onto rails. And these skates I had were brand new and they did not have that groove. And I jumped on this big rail and in Rhode Island in the evening, the, we had like this kind of evening practice. The ground gets a little wet. The course back then was just horrid too, if you see the first X Games. And they painted the surface, but threw a little bit of like sand in it so that there would be a little grip because they knew it was really slippery. So anyway, I'm grinding down this rail and I feel my back foot shift a little bit. And my plan was to go front side, which is just a real basic trick where your legs are like in an A-frame position. I'm going down that and my plan was to land backwards. And I go down that rail and I felt my back foot shift a little bit. And I was like, oh, I'm going to land forwards, kind of like halfway down the grind. And I land and the ground's a little slippery from that dew in the air and the sketchy painted surface. And I, I landed on both my feet, but my right foot kind of slipped a little bit mm -hmm. and I blew my ACL right there. Ugh. That was the game changer, as you said. That's when I realized I was like, whoa, okay, this isn't forever, but I love this. So I got to figure out how to stay in it. And then from then on, I got to skate on my own terms because I started helping team manage and design and do marketing. And I got to skate and have the most fun because there wasn't pressure for me anymore because I just didn't really worry about it. I didn't have to because I'd designed a really good skate for K2 and put together this incredible team and just had fun with skating from then, which was great. You go from being like a K2 pro to moving in-house. What does that look like? Do they eventually, like you're hurt <laughs> and you're rehabbing and they're like, hey, we'd like to have you move out here? Because you're like a teenager. You're like 19 years old or something like that. Yeah, I'm young. I'm pretty young. And man, I think there was like a year where I was recovering from surgery. I still skated and I don't know, I think I went maybe a year and a half before they, Matt LaCrosse asked me to move to Seattle and work out on Vashon. That was weird because I was probably 20 when I moved there. And dude, I was just a skate punk. It was corporate world there, you know? And I show up and I'm like you said, I'm basically still a, just a kid, a skater. And in the mix with all these corporate people and all their methods of corporate life that I was not aware of and etiquette and all that, I had to learn a lot. And it was incredibly difficult for me to sit in that chair all day. I remember just like going insane, you know, like, couldn't wait for the next trip because sitting and, and that was like the internet was just starting to happen it was incredibly boring working in there i learned a ton but it was weird getting used to just the, the kind of corporate -y stuff that goes on you work at a big company and learning all that and i don't know they respected me somewhat but i was a kid you know so 
in general, it was a really cool place to work. The engineers were really smart. They listened to the skaters. It was rad. Like I'd go there almost every day and sit down with the engineers and they legitimately listened to what I wanted to do with the product. And that was awesome. And when you get to that company, there's a ski element, a snowboard element, a skate element, a bike element. And I don't know what you're doing in the back, but it's making all kinds of crazy noise. But either way, <laughs> you, you've got those elements and you're the inline guy and people don't like the inline category at K2. I don't think at all because it takes money away from other categories, even though eventually it drives money to everybody. But yeah, yeah, the employees that think they're too cool for school because there's a lot of those people there. How do they treat you being the skate guy? Do they embrace you or are they just like, fuck that kid? You know, Matt LaCrosse and I knew that we were making that company so much money. So we were a little arrogant ourselves. <laughs> um, so we rolled in there pretty confident. And I don't know. I just didn't really pay attention to it all that much. I was just so focused on skating. And I didn't know anything about skiing. And I knew snowboarding a bit because I watched like Riders on the Storm and some videos like that when I was that age. But skating was just the focus. And K2 Inline had a separate building that we worked at. K2 North. During those times. Yeah. So we didn't mingle that much. And the only time I went over to the other building was to meet with the engineers. And I would just pop in there. Hilary Reitenberg and I and Jim Vandergrift and Doug Grande. And that, those are the dudes that I would work with on a day-to-day -day basis, which was awesome. It's time for my second round of sponsors. And Stanley is a brand that I trust. I like the people who work there. And I've always been a big fan of their products. They've been around since 1913. And they invented the keep things hot and cold categories. You know, it's that green bottle that your grandpa took everywhere that he possibly went. That's Stanley. And unlike these new copycat brands, Stanley has stayed true to itself, not jacking up their prices like everyone else that markets themselves as an outdoor adventure brand. Stanley is the original. And because they love my show and you, my listeners, they're offering the best deal you're going to find anywhere from Stanley right here. You're going to get 30% off all things Stanley. I highly recommend picking up a set of the pint glasses as I use them on a daily basis. To get the deal, what you need to do is head on over to Stanley1913.com, go shopping. At checkout, you're going to enter the code DRINKFAST. That's all one word and you'll get the deal. If you spend over $100, I'll send you a Powell Movement beanie on top of that. In keeping with the theme of original, my next sponsor, Rollerblade, pretty much invented inline skating. And based on all of us being stuck inside for way too long over this pandemic, getting outside and getting in shape and having fun should be the priority. And that's what Rollerblade is best at. They make the most comfortable, high-performance skates on the market that you can use for training, transportation, or preparing for ski season. And ski season is so close that now's the time to download Rollerblade's award-winning Skate to Ski app. It will put you on the path to having your best ski season ever. You can download the Skate to Ski app on the App Store and find out everything else about Rollerblade over at rollerblade.com. My final sponsor is Alpine Vans. And in this day and age of having a mobile adventure unit, from start to finish, no one makes the van building process easier, more fun, and most importantly, better than the rest. Well, I could go on about the beauty of their builds. You can check out the 15-minute look at Cody Townsend's van that he created for the 50 Project with Alpine Vans and get an idea of what paying attention to every single detail means. Cody's rig is a functional thing of beauty that looks as good as it performs. And Alpine Vans is your one-stop shop to make the van of your dreams a reality. They have the designers and fabricators who have all have degrees but have also lived the life. Think ski patrollers who open and close resorts and live in the lots. Mountain bikers who will spend weeks upon end in their vehicle using that as their mobile adventure unit. These guys have lived it, they understand it, and that experience is what makes them the best. And right now, while other people are scrambling to find vehicles because of the technology shortage, Alpine has eight Mercedes Sprinters ready to go. You can have your dream mobile in your driveway in 90 days. So head on over to alpinevans.com to start your build today. Those are my sponsors. Now let's get back into the podcast. When K2 gets the original drawings for the fatty for you, is that what they paid you $500 for? Because I believe like you signed a contract for 500 bucks, sent them some 2D drawings. And in three, four years of that skate, they probably sold a half a million skates, but you got 500 bucks for it. I did. I did, Mike. <laughs> you know, we didn't know. You know what I mean? Like no one knew what was about to happen. Really, maybe we, I would have known more, but 
like I said, you know, my parents weren't following skating. They didn't understand action sports, skateboarding, skiing, any of this stuff. So I think they just thought like I was just out there screwing around and like I didn't really have anyone giving me any advice really, you know. I think my like sculpture teacher at, at Atlanta College of Art told me to ask for money or something, but I was just like, oh, they're going to put me on, travel me around the world. And that's what happened. And I don't know, I was making, I don't know, like $3,000, $4,000 a month when all my friends were in college. So I was like, in my mind, I was killing it. But man, if I would have gotten a little cut of that, who knows? Yeah, totally. So with all of your sponsors, is that when you're making three, four grand a month? I think that's probably about right. So you're making yeah. like right around 40 grand a year when you're 19, 20 yeah. years old? Yeah. And I think, you know, at my max pay at K2, I was like 65 grand a year or something, which was at that age again, you know, my friends were all in college. And so I got a great business education out of it. I met friends all around the world. I am where I am today because of all that. And so there's some gratitude there. You know, I definitely tell Matt Lacrosse, thank you every time I see him or anytime I'm, I'm thinking of the dude, I reach out to him because he put me on and Matt Lacrosse, he had a good vision of what Inline could have been. It wasn't really realized, but he put the right people on to build something cool. And we did, man. We had a really rad, rad squad that was involved with K2. And the sport's totally blowing up at this point. Now, are you getting crazy opportunities like the Vans Warp Tours and pop culture shit that the sport doesn't see anymore? Were you part of any of that stuff? You know, I skated in some of that. Most of the stuff I did was the ASA Pro Tour stuff, which was always sponsored by somebody cool, Sony or Panasonic, I think was the big one. So I was involved with all that. But really, like when Gravity Games and those things started hitting, I wasn't competing really anymore. I was just skating and getting clips here and there and videos and I was starting to get more in marketing and team and design stuff more and more. So I saw all that go down and, you know, it's just uh, a bunch of young dudes that didn't really know what was in front of them, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's kind of how that shook down. How about any other starstruck moments? Like you're at an event and maybe you're not competing, but holy shit, I'm smoking weed with Cypress Hill. Does anything like that happen? Yeah, well, B. Harden was friends with 311 from when he lived in Colorado, and 311 would play over by them, and he was go to Nebraska for whatever reason, and so B. got 311 involved on a lot of the first videos, and so we were all friends with the dudes from 311, and several times B. and I were like, I remember we were skating in San Francisco all day one day, and he's like, 311's playing the night, we're on the guest list, sick, you know, we went over there and hung out with him on their tour bus, and then watch their sound check and party with them afterwards on the tour bus. And it was just like, it was super rad. And we've met just all, all these events. There's like, you just meet people when you travel. It's cool. I've, I've uh, met all kinds of really cool people that I'll never forget. <laughs> I feel like 311's career was on a parallel path with aggressive inline skating as well. It was. Yeah, it was. So in talking about the fatty, which was K2's real entry into the aggressive market, for lack of a better yeah. term, did you have to fight for the name fatty? Like, hey, we need to make a big splash and the name is a big deal. And who cares if this is a weed reference? It was, uh, <laughs> it was so cool because anything we said, they would just do it. <laughs> and, and, and we didn't. It's not like at Rollerblade where I work now, I've got several people, we vet things, you know, and it's, it's a group kind of move. But then it was just like, me and Matt Lacrosse and the designers and Matt would just be like, Hey, we need a name. What's the name? Hey, we need to design the box. Can you design the box? And I just drew some stuff up and sent it over. I mean, literally like drew it on big pieces of cardboard and sent it over and then they scanned it and <laughs> made it the box and stuff, you know? So we got away with a bunch of funny stuff, man. And they, they did some cool stuff. Like you take out the wheel and there's like a little drawing that I did. And then another wheel that be hard and drew this weird little mountain man character. And the box had a cool, like, drawing that I did on it on the side on the label and it had some feel to it which wasn't going on a lot back then it's not it doesn't happen now even in our sport as much you know yeah I mean I'll say even when I was there there was no one really caring about what was happening on the inline side as long as skates were selling so when they wanted to make a fatty junior they were like hey should we call it the fatty junior I'm like well in keeping tradition what those guys did we should call <laughs> yes. it the fatty J and that's what it was called. Our kid skate was the Fatty J. I couldn't believe it happened, but it did. I'm almost yeah. embarrassed that I was the guy that helped name it, but it did happen. All the names were ridiculous, you know? For yeah. Style Points Bob, that was just like what Matt Lacrosse called people that dressed funny, you know? It's like, 
we took about four seconds to figure out names for things and, and people never forget them. You know, it's not like whatever basic RJ 3000 thing that people name stuff these days. It's just like, I miss that stuff, man. It was fun and it reflected the culture way more, you know? I do. And back then, are you having to travel to China to make inline skates? Do you get that experience as well? I got to go to Korea. So the skates were made in Pusan, Korea, and that's the first international trip I went on. And I was terrified. I remember John Svensson, who's the head engineer at K2. I think he still works there. Yeah. Love that man. Freaking genius. And I remember him saying, we need you to come to see the first productions of the skates. Come off the line. If there's anything you need to fix, we need to put the skates on you, skate around, and we'll fix it right there. And I remember him telling me, he's like, it's going to be a long flight. You're going to land at this airport and you're going to get on this bus and then you're going to be, you know, it was like multiple transfers, you know, and I'm just like, oh my God, dude, get to Korea and like, it's just crazy. I remember going in to get the food and we go in this tiny little Korean like grill place. I ordered like chicken skewers and they brought the chicken out and it was like not cooked and I had to ask them to cook it. <laughs> it was just like, I might as well have been on Mars, man. You know, it was so different than America. I recommend everyone try and go to China or Korea or whatever, because it's just so different, man. It's really cool. And back in the 90s, were there questionable factory practices back then? Because it was before people started caring about human rights, I feel like. It was gnarly. Straight up gnarly. I remember being in there watching the skates get made, and I got high from the glue. It was so strong. And my clothes smelled the whole rest of the day and eating like glue. And I remember like going out to the car and the urine from the urinals just went out into the street <laughs> and the canals all through there were just literally like the nastiest thing you've ever seen in your life you know it's just so bad but it was a different time i'm glad those folks don't have to work that way again because i remember leaving there just like oh my gosh these little korean women in there building the skates they had smaller hands so they could like get in there and glue the stuff up and dude it was it was wild it was really cool to see a skate assembly line too to figure that out and engineer all that, it took a lot of a lot of horsepower in the brains. Spencer and those guys were really smart guys. Well, that's the positive that they're really smart guys, but sometimes everyone fucks up. And yeah. you happened to be there, I think you were there at least, when they had the huge cuff breakage problem. And that had to mm -hmm. be an absolute nightmare for everyone involved. What was that like? Yeah, it was terrible. Like everything was killing it and then all of a sudden the cuffs were cracking. They would just crease like above the cuff fold and they had to do a big recall. Thank God I wasn't involved with that. I've been involved with those things subsequently and it's not fun. You got to recall all the skates and bring them back in if you can to get them off the streets so people don't get hurt. Yeah, anytime it's a safety issue, it's kind of early. I remember the execs were stressing because like you said, there was probably 200,000 pairs of those things on the market by that time that they had to deal with. <laughs> yeah, just a nightmare for any manufacturer. But that happens and you don't own the company, so it doesn't really affect yeah, you that matter. much. But how does K2 end for you? Because we can't talk about K2 the whole time. Man, as you know, I think they started getting into all kinds of stuff. They started making bikes and they own like fishing rod companies and diversifying like crazy outside of the normal stuff at that time. And the bike thing came on and like, the first bikes that came out, the shocks were exploding. So there's a huge recall on that. Inline skating was like, it's a business, right? So they're looking at the trend. It's like, oh, it was going up. Now it's going down, down. The down looks like it's going to continue. And so me being the youngest guy there, I got laid off. There was a couple people before me that got laid off. But then pretty much within a year and a half, the whole thing got put to bed. And then from there, man, I remember my last day at K2. It was a Friday and they were like, you can come back Monday if you want and get your stuff. I was like, I'm getting my stuff right now. And I got my stuff and I had my bike on the island, I think. But I remember I rode to the other building and there was a payphone out from there. And I called my brother and I was like, I just got laid off, man. And he was like, well, now what are you going to do? You know, I was like, I want to start a skate shop. And, and he was involved with some internet startup stuff at the time. And he was like, you should start an online shop, man. He's like, I, I know what we need to do. And your name still stands. and Andy Cruz's name and Frankie and Frankie Lascavio stayed at Atlanta College of Art and he learned graphic design and web design stuff there. Called him. He's in. Andy was down to help work. My wife, who wasn't my wife at the time, but we were living together. We moved back to Atlanta and we started skatepile.com and that thing, it went off really quickly and grew super quick. 
we changed the way stuff was sold online, you know, and in a lot of ways we were forerunners of how to do that. And again, I learned a shitload there too. <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah. So you guys were crushing it. You were like the intersection yeah. of retail and culture. There are a couple other players out there in the online mm-hmm. space, but you were going to be the authentic guys who could have the team yeah. and the content. Because everything that you did, it seemed like, was always team first, whether it was K2 or anywhere. If you didn't even have a product in the marketplace, you probably had a $30,000 team out there promoting what was going to be coming, it seemed like, with some of your stuff. So yeah. you were going to take a different aspect or a different approach to how you were going to build the business. And it worked from the get-go. But you're yeah. still a hard goods guy. And the next big project that you have, other than your online shop, which is crushing it, is physics, which is a suspension frame, which is game changing. It changes the way that people skate almost. It saves your knees. They're incredible. But the tech was owned by a strange individual who (laughs) wanted more of a say than you guys would let him have. Yeah. And while I don't know if you could get around working with crazy Keith is what I will call him. (laughs) Could you have made frames without having to sign a contract with him and kind of changed the patent a little bit? We probably could have. But, you know, I'm, I'm massively respectful of someone's creative ideas. I've got ideas of my own that have been used and didn't get permission for, blah, blah, blah. So without meeting him, he came to K2 really like the last six months I was there, presented this prototype. It was a jalopy, like literally made of screws and bent metal. And I remember rolling off the curb out in front of the offices and the suspension system compressed that the wheels hit the bottom of the boot and I fell. <laughs> But you could feel it when you skated around the parking lot, that float. And I was like, there's something to this. And so as soon as I left and we we're doing skate pile starting that, I kept in contact with him. And we had a bunch of different prototypes trying to make it work. And we couldn't make it work to where the wheels would not end up hitting the bottom of the boot. And one night I was falling asleep and it dawned on me what we could do to prevent that. That's what made the thing actually work for street skating and jumping downstairs and stuff like that. So yeah, that whole process was quite a learning experience and the, and the two businesses don't work good together you got a business where you're running an online shop you get the stuff in you try and flip it as fast as possible with physics we would buy quantity for like three four months turn it you know and then you get people terms you collect on your money so the cash flows didn't match you know what i mean and you guys were making a product where people were buying frames for 50 bucks and you're selling them for like 150 bucks that's right you're yeah. making them in the u.s and it- why not partner with a bigger brand and kind of maybe lose some of the ownership or lose a little bit of control? We probably should have. <laughs> Just you were young and you didn't think to do yeah. it. You wanted the total control. Skate our own. Yeah. Like we had to do it to the point like we were making in the US and then we were like, man, they're, they're too expensive. They were selling, but not at the quantities that we needed to, to stay in business. And so one of our customers for Skate Pile, this kid's dad was an injection molding dude out in Mexico. And he said, hey, we, my son loves your product. We want to make it for you. We can make it for way cheaper, blah, blah, blah. So we moved our molds down to Mexico, met with the guy, seen great. This facility was awesome. He was making packaging for like Waffle House and Tupperware and all these huge accounts. So our little order for a couple thousand pairs of skate frames just kept getting pushed to the side for these bigger orders. And we didn't get our first delivery of stuff for like ages on one round of the stuff that you know we we paid our bills for eight months and we didn't have product for eight months and simultaneously you could go online and you could go to yahoo and you could start up an online skate shop for next to nothing and we had this infrastructure and a custom website that required a team of people to keep it going in this frame business and it all slowly was just like brr and the category was getting smaller every year so eventually we had to get out and we sold Skate Pile to Roller Warehouse, and then that was that, man. It was a hell of a ride. And it's like the worst time in your life to have a hell of a ride. You've got two kids, a wife, and you've got to be able to pay for your family. Are you left with a shitload of debt as well, where it's like, not only do you out of the skate industry at this point, but you still have to keep paying for the skate stuff? Yeah, it was terrible because we had investors. Some of those were family members, and people lost considerable amounts of money. And that was really tough. And then me personally, I think I, when it was all said and done, I think I had like $30,000 in debt of my own. I had two kids, a wife and a mortgage and a car payment. And all I'd done is skate at that point And I had dropped out of art school. So oh. needless to say, I was freaking out. And I remember I went one day and I saw that Ford was hiring salespeople. 
And I was like, I'm going to have to get a, a real job, you know? And I went and I got trained to sell cars, to sell trucks particularly. And during that period, I was also sending my resume around and I sent it to Rollerblade, didn't hear anything back. And then suddenly I did hear something back. <laughs> so Jeremy Stonier, who was one of the big guys at Rollerblade in New Jersey, where it was at the time, he remembered meeting me at Greg's Green Lake, which was a skate bike snow shop in Seattle. Jeremy's a Seattle guy. Yeah, Jeremy's a Seattle guy. So Jeremy managed Green Lake, that shop at the time. And he met me. I was in the back room. I wasn't supposed to be back there, but my good friend Chris Spring was one of the employees there. And I came to wax my board because we were snowboarding the next day. And I'm in the back, like taking the wax off my board and waxing it and stuff. And Jeremy goes, who's this dude in the back? What's he doing in there? And at the time, my poster was on the wall in the shop, right? For K2, <laughs> for the fatty. And Chris Spring's like, that's Tom, man. That's his poster in there, you know, like. He's all good, he, you know, and so Jeremy rolls back and we meet. I barely remember this, but Jeremy rem remembers it well, and I guess I made a good impression. And so when my resume hit his desk, you know, he knew what I had sold at Skate Pile. We were one of their biggest dealers. And then he remembered meeting me at Greg's, and he was like, hey, man, you should come up here for an interview. And I was like, yes, man. And so I went up there, and I had my whole spiel about how I was going to make Rollerway better and what they were doing wrong from my point of view. He was stoked on that came home and it, no one else is in a hurry when you need a job, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> it laid dormant for like another, I don't know, six, eight weeks. I call him back. I was like, hey, you know, so what's the deal? I'm about to start working at Ford. And he's like, well, we want you to fly to Italy to interview with the international brand manager there. And I remember going over there, like I wore a suit. You know what I mean? You got to get this job. I've got to get this job. And I went over there and did my spiel in front of all of them. It was, it was their like international dealers meeting. It was at the end of it. Everyone was tired. All the higher ups wait around to hear my spiel. I nailed it. And then the next day, I remember Stefano Auburn, who was the international brand manager there, like he puts his arm around me. We're walking in there and like gives me a big hug, you know, and he's like, well, I really like you. I think we're going to work with you. And I was like, yes. And I came home and I had a job, man. That's what I've been doing since then. But my God, did I need a job at that moment? <laughs> well, it's amazing because if you look at it, like you've been in inline skating more than anyone else in the world. All those guys from your pro days, I don't think anybody is still around except for Isaac Altman's maybe. Yeah. So between you and him, no one has the longevity in the world of inline skating than you. You probably have more knowledge of everything inline than almost anybody in the world. I don't think there's anybody that would know Thanks, all the Mike. ins and outs. I mean, it's just based on your time spent, you being a tinkerer, you being an engineer without being an engineer. Yeah. You are that guy in the world. And now you're the marketing guru, developing products, speed skating, urban skating, doing everything for rollerblade, it seems like. And the sport's seen its ups and downs. You've experienced the ups and downs. But skating seems to be doing better now than it has been doing in a long time. Was there a big fear when the pandemic started and then you realized you need to build more skates as fast as you could? Yeah, it's funny. And I'm sure you heard this from other people, but I remember my boss, Stephen Chair, calling me like, time to batten down the hatches. We got to slash everything. It's over, you know, like not over, but like we got to prepare for the worst, you know? Yeah. And so we'd made like DEF CON plans, you know? I remember like taking the marketing budget, just tearing it down to nothing. And then, you know, just getting, I was like, I'm going to have to call the riders and let all these dudes go and all this thing. I mean, that it wasn't a big program at the time because there wasn't big marketing dollars at all, but man, it was terrifying. And then all of a sudden, literally like six weeks later, the demand just soared and we're like, okay, this thing is blowing up and it's your job to keep these new people skating. <laughs> so it's like, uh. And by the way, your budget's going to be way bigger. So you're used to running like this garage van kind of thing. Right. Where it's like, we got enough to make, you know, a thousand stickers and 500 t-shirts and we're going to go on three trips or whatever, you know? Right. To like a freaking billboard in Times Square, you know? So it's a stark contrast and it's been a, another learning experience for old Tom because I've got to manage a lot more. You get a bigger marketing budget, the marketing guy's busier, you know? So... I'm incredibly busy and I've had to learn to get really good at using Asana and delegating and all that stuff. It's been good. It's been very stressful. I'm happy it's happening and happy we're in this position. And I'm really just happy that society accepts the sport now. You know, I think it's likely here to stay because you got all these kids that learned to skate when they were kids. They became adults with kids. 
they're skating again. They're teaching their kids to skate again. So the healthy cycle is there. We don't have that situation like we did in the early 90s where everyone got skates, half the people broke their wrists. It's this group of people that already kind of knew how to skate teaching younger kids how to skate. It's a pretty cool opportunity to, to be in right now. And there, there's, there was times in the mix there where I was just like, what am I doing in this industry? Like it's shrinking and I'm not progressing in my career. And like, what am I doing here? I'll tell you what you weren't doing. You weren't selling used cars. No, I wasn't. I wasn't. There were going to be new trucks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was glad. You know, I was glad because I, I got to keep traveling. I got to keep going in the sport and doing all those things, man, and maintaining friendships. I was just in New York and hung out with some of my best friends that I've been friends with for freaking nearly 30 years. You know, it's awesome. It's amazing. And it's amazing where the sport is right now, because who would have thought three years ago that you would be in the position that you are now with bigger budgets and less time than you've ever had on your hands. And it's great to see. At this point in the show, I have something that I like to call inappropriate questions. And I need to thank Andy Cruz so much for coming through with three questions because he lives in Finland. He's one of your best friends from like third grade on. He also made it as a pro. And we just started talking a couple days ago for me trying to get these inappropriate questions. And I got them while we were doing the podcast. So I haven't heard these questions yet. <laughs> Andy's a teacher in Finland who is very considerate of, hey, I can't mess up his corporate job. I can't mess up his relationship with his wife. I can't mess up his kid's opinion of him. And I'm going to come up with three inappropriate yeah. questions. So we said all that. And then he came up with three questions. I'm going to open the email right now and play you question number one. Hopefully it doesn't take me a long time to figure out how to do this. Here we go. So Tom. Tell us what that secret incognito artwork design was that you put on the outside of the K2 skate box that only us skaters knew what it was, but the corporates had no idea. What was that emblem? <laughs> okay, so there was a thing called dick tricks that used to happen, and Andy was very talented at that. What was it called? There were dick tricks. Oh, dick tricks. And Andy had this move called the brain. You squeeze your testicles and it looks like a brain. Okay. And so... We were like, okay, we got to do the box. And Andy was in my room that day. And we're like, what are we going to do in this box? And he's like, I dare you to draw the brain. I dare you to draw the brain. It was the thing that Andy would draw everywhere. It's like two oval circles, basically. But it had pubic hairs drawn off of it. And I was like, dude, we can't. Like, that's so obvious what that is. We can't do that. And then we're like, well, what if we did it without the pubic hairs? And so that's what we did. So the first K2 boxes, I mean, for years, they had the big testicles on it without pubic hairs. So that was inspired by Andy's balls. That was. There you go. That is amazing. It really was the wild, wild west. So Andy came through with his first question. We're going to have to see what he does with question number two. <laughs> Here we go. So what technique did you use to resolve a disagreement that you and I had as best friends and business partners at Skatepile.com? <laughs> How did you choose to solve the argument that we had in the office that day? All right. What was the argument about first? Yeah. Okay. So I was basically the, I don't know, art director or whatever, but Frankie was the guy that was super sick on the computer to do graphics. And so basically any ads that we did, this is when print ads were still a thing. And there's an ad in Daily Bread and it, it was a lot of money to do these ads at the time. So like we wanted to do good stuff and our ads were always pretty crazy and fun and everything. But Andy wanted to do an ad where it was a girl with her boobs hanging out with skate pile stickers on it. And mm -hmm. I was just like, that's just so dumb. You know what I mean? Like, no, we're not going to do that, you know? Right. Basically, that's what started the whole thing, man, is that they made this ad. They submitted it to Daily Red, and I found out about it. And Frankie and Andy were just like, we're doing it. We're doing it anyway, man. And, like, we would vote on everything, and most of the stuff we would resolve through a vote. And like, we're doing it anyway. We're sending it anyway. And, like. I was like, the hell you are, you know? And so we started literally fighting in the office. And, you know, my wrestling skills, I took Andy and I did like a hip toss headlock thing. And his legs went through the drywall into my wife's office. Like, <laughs> we nearly went through the wall completely. <laughs> and we were just beating the crap out of each other. And my brother worked there at the time. And Aaron came in. Everyone that was there like, what are you doing? And broke it all up. But yeah, I mean, Andy scrapped, man. He's, he's a pretty tough, wiry little dude. So we were going after it. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Drama. All right. We'll go with his final inappropriate question. Here we go. What was the type of comedy called that you and I used to perform at parties where we had a crowd of people standing around us laughing in shock and awe? 
the form of comedy that your wife actually at one point banned you from ever doing again. <laughs> what was this comedy called? So that was the dick trick stuff. Yeah. That was a thing that happened with my brother's friends that we carried on and that got eliminated for good reason. But like, if you've been around Andy in the party atmosphere, man, it's funny and there's no rules when Andy starts to have a good time. It was hilarious and crazy. It's something that would never happen in this day and age, but in a different time, it was wilder. Andy, I remember we were at a K2 function back in the day. Andy Bulkalter was there like playing pool with her friends and he did that. And she like hit him over the head with a pool cue or something and just started laughing and continued to play pool. Wait, he brained her? Yeah, he brained her. Oh, man. I don't remember if it was directly at her. She saw it and she like whacked him with the pool cue and just laughed and continued to play pool. It's so awesome. But yeah, it was pretty funny, immature, like teenage dude stuff that was going down for sure. Thanks, Andy. I have a high school friend that still does that stuff, and his favorite move is the bird bath, where he grabs his sack and he pulls it out and it kind of stretches, and then he pours <laughs> water in it. And it's pretty funny. Or not water, it's usually beer. <laughs> All right. Well, I will leave that for inappropriate questions. We've known each other for 20, Forever. probably, yeah, 20 years. And you've always been a wealth of knowledge and just a good dude to hang out with. Like you were always Thanks, working man. for other brands. You never had problems giving me advice at K2, even though you probably had bad taste at one point in your mouth for K2. It didn't matter to you. You were going to help regardless. And I think we tried to help out too. I think we bought a bunch of physics frames, but yeah, it's always been a pleasure to be able to work with you. And I always feel like really cool to be able to call you a friend. So Thanks, Mike. I thank you for your time, man. And that's our podcast. Cool. And one more little shout for me is check out Blank Rolling Products on Instagram. It's the new brand I'm doing and we're trying to get people to check it out. And the new stuff's hitting stores in November. So if you're in the market for getting some awesome street skates, check out the Blank stuff by Rollerblade. Awesome, man. Well, I will get a pair of those and a pair of something else because you guys didn't have pairs of anything to give me when we signed up and you said you would. So I'm yeah. going to call you on that at some point. I got you. Yeah, I, we got them coming in. So we'll dial in. Mike. Good chatting with you, buddy. So that was time with Tom Heiser. And what a good dude. He's one of those genuinely nice people, which is why I think he had a really hard time with the inappropriate questions. He was really concerned about them, but I assured him that I've had much worse than a set of testicles on a skate box. Shit. When I was at K2, one of our designers made a pattern for a plastic gift bag that was made out of roosters. So if you thought about it, it was a bag of cocks. It was brilliant and we never heard one complaint and we gave away over 10,000 bags over a couple years. Knowing that, I doubt many people had complaints with Tom's ball box either. And the backstory for it is amazing. And Tom's story, well, he's the only blader to have a happy ending as the sport left a lot of people to hang out to dry. But Tom, he's still going strong at Rollerblade. That's the show. At this point, it's time for the review of the week. And it comes from a good friend and longtime listener, Ray McMillan. And since I know Ray, you'd think he'd give me a five-star review. But he gave me a one-star review. What's up with that, Ray? His review is titled, The Modern Johnny Carson. Powell is the modern Johnny Carson of the action sports world. He brings us a variety of game-changing athletes and industry professionals into our listening platforms. Whether I'm working on bikes, tuning skis, commuting to work, or road tripping, your topics pairing back to your celebrity guests always make the time pass by at an entertaining pace. I would like to see a live stream of the podcast in the future if possible to see the live reactions of your questions or whoever is shouting out the inappropriate questions. It could make for some awesome entertainment. And it's time to call out Mike Goot for a podcast. Keep up the great work, Powell. Love, Ray. Well, thank you very much for that review, Ray. It is always great to hear from you. I wish we could spend more time together, but we really can't with this pandemic. It's kept us so far apart and it's so sad and lives are changing and we have kids and we really just can't make time to see each other anymore. But I know you are killing it down there in Mammoth and I wish I could be there more often. Thank you for that review, Ray. I will send you a beanie. All you need to do is email me. Actually, you can text me because you have my number. But for anybody else that wants to play this game, here's what you need to do to get yourself a beanie. You need to put a review on iTunes, and if you put a review somewhere else, I'll honor that. Just send me a link to the review at mikeatthepowellmovement.com, and if I read that review on the show, send that address and email with your shipping info, and I'll send you a limited edition Powell Movement beanie. If you're outside of the United States, I am too cheap to ship internationally, and the paperwork for international shipments, well, it's a total pain in the ass. 
So if I read yours, I will still ship a beanie to a friend of yours who lives in the U.S. That's the only thing I'm going to do. I'm sorry about that. At this point, I want to thank you for listening, regardless of where you're listening from, the U.S. or elsewhere. And I want to ask you to buy stuff from my sponsors. I only work with the best brands, and they are Alpine Vans, Stanley, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Dragon Alliance, The Ten Barrel Brewery, and Rollerblade. Have a great week, everyone.